Good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to be here today for a really engaged conversation on uh, inequality and climate change. And I think for this panel, one of the reasons I'm so excited is because of the people I'm able to talk about, uh, talk to about this really critical and uh, fundamental issue. My name is Carlton Waterhouse, and I'm a professor of law at the Howard University uh, School of Law, and I'm the director of the Environmental and Climate Justice Center there at Howard where we spend a lot of time working with communities to address their environmental and climate challenges, and then also to engage in advocacy around establishing policies that will uh, provide support and protection uh, for communities in terms of dealing with the climate justice challenges that they face. Now, uh, one of the reasons I'm excited is because I'm joined today for this conversation with two luminaries in the climate space. Uh, to my immediate left, we have Gina McCarthy. And uh, Gina is not only uh, uh, of international acclaim for her leadership at the Environmental Protection Agency and the work that went forward around climate while she was there, as well as all the other streams of work that EPA does, but also for her work most recently in the White House in the Biden-Harris administration, where she served as the National Climate Advisor. Um, and then uh, to her left, uh, immediate left, we are honored to have uh, Pedro Conceição. And Pedro serves as the director of the United Nations Development Program, uh, where he has been addressing uh, you know, uh, development reports that are engaging with this and other critical issues. And so uh, both of them bring a wealth of experience and a wealth of information uh, to this important conversation. So uh, with no further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. So just to begin with, uh, with you, Pedro, um, I want to talk about the experience that you bring in terms of your economics research, both at the uh, United Nations Development Program, but also in the academy. Uh, and through your work, I want to find out from you, what do you see as the driving forces behind economic inequality and the political polarization that we see in the United States and increasingly around the world? And how do you see climate change connected to the bigger issue of global inequality? Thank you, Carlton. I want to say first that uh, Gina is the luminary. I'm not the luminary. <laughs> um, I, I think that uh, the relationship between um, climate change and inequality has evolved quite, quite a bit. I think there was a time in which inequality or economic inequality was, was perhaps seen as a problem of the here and now, uh, and climate change a problem that would play out far away and uh, into the future. And I think that uh, over time, with contributions from science, as the evidence has accumulated, we've seen that the two are coming more and more together. I don't think we need to overstate the case and say that they overlap fully, uh, but they have become much more uh, intertwined. Uh, and we can see this in different ways. For instance, we know uh, that uh, people uh, that are going to be subject to uh, the worst negative effects uh, of many of the implications of climate change are the ones with the least capability uh, to cope. Uh, we see that uh, when it comes to uh, disasters linked to, to natural hazards, this was probably true uh, at all times or at most times and in most disasters, uh, but with the fact that there's evidence that climate change is uh, exacerbating some of these natural hazards, some of tropical uh, tropical cyclones, for instance, are becoming uh, more intense and more, more frequent, this exacerbates uh, inequality. So this is one of the challenges through which we see this playing out. Uh, we also see it uh, in the way in which climate change is um, putting ecosystems under stress uh, in regions like the Sahel or the Horn of Africa, 
that are making it more difficult for these ecosystems to support uh, livelihoods. And we see that these are regions where there is an overlap with political tensions and sometimes violent conflict. So this is another channel which uh, climate change is exacerbating um, inequalities. In our latest human development report that you alluded to, uh, we um, report on some findings from uh, a data platform that I would encourage all of you to consult called Human Climate Horizons, that basically assesses prospects for human development, uh, which is not only how um, the economy is going to perform, but also how health and education opportunities are going to evolve and the different climate change scenarios from now until the end of the century. Uh, and when, what, we, what we find is that, for instance, mortality rates are going to increase much more uh, in lower latitudes than in higher latitudes. And lower latitudes are the regions of the world in which lower levels of human development are currently concentrated. So you can see another channel through which um, uh, climate change can exas uh, exacerbate inequalities, in this case, uh, across countries, but many of these dynamics also play out um, within countries. I'll, I'll perhaps give one final example before uh, um, uh, coming to a close, and perhaps polarization we can discuss in, in, in the, later in the, in the conversation. Uh, if we look at climate, uh, uh, sorry, at fossil fuel subsidies, um, which uh, contribute also to um, uh, 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 emissions, uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and therefore to climate change, they are extremely inefficient from a global uh, perspective. Our colleagues at the IMF estimate that they cost the global economy trillions of dollars. Um, but they are also regressive, meaning that they tend to be more beneficial to those that are better off than those that are less well off. So I guess the question after um, reporting on all of, of this evidence is why is it so difficult to act? Uh, and why is it so difficult to marshal all of this evidence and translate it into political actions? Some, some is happening, obviously. It's not like nothing is happening, but perhaps not with intensity uh, and the speed uh, that is required. And one of the reasons is related to political polarization, but we'll come back to it later on, if you agree, Carl. Absolutely, thank you so much. Before we go to you, Gina, I need to stop for a public service announcement. Okay. So I just wanted to let everyone know that we are going to have our conversation. And then after that, we'll have a break for questions and answers. And for those of you who are both uh, in person in the hall, you'll be able to come forward to the microphones to ask questions. And for those of you who are online, we'll also enable you to submit questions in the Slido box below the live stream and do that at any point during this session. Uh, and staff will be monitoring those questions that you post and we'll make sure that they get fed into our discussion here. So thank you very much. Gina. Yes. Um, What's Slido? <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Blue lips. You have decades of experience working both at the state, federal government level, uh, and in the White House to advance environmental climate policies. Now you're co-leading America's All In, which is a coalition of leaders across the United States supporting climate action. How are climate policies, or how can climate policies rather be designed to make sure that they are not exacerbating what are the existing economic inequalities and other inequalities that we face in the society? And, um, and the benefits as well uh, that come from changes that we're going to make to address climate. Well, let me start first of all by thanking you, but also I would like to chastise you for not mentioning that you worked at EPA. Um, <laughs> this is upsetting to me. Um, that should have been the first thing you said. Um, as, as you well know, um, I love EPA. Um, so, but I, I really appreciate it. It's, it's great to be with you again, honestly. Uh, we, had, we had a good run. Um, but also, Pedro, I, I wanted to congratulate you for the work that you're doing. Um, I, I, I think we mentioned before, I, I read the human development report that you put out. And honestly, I, I, it's an absolute must read. 
Uh, it's very long, so I can't say I, I read every single thing on every page. It's, a, it's an easy but it, read. It, 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 it's, it's, but it's, it provided information that, for me, that was really startling in terms of the, where the world is heading at this point and the challenges that we all face. You know, this push that we see to populism and totalitarianism is, you know, I, I thought it was a problem for me. Uh, it's a problem for everybody. Um, and so the, the work that you're doing is, I think, incredibly important, not just internationally, but certainly in, in our country as well. Uh, but let me get to, to your question, Carlton, if I actually remember it at this point for having jabbered as long as I did. You know, it, you know that, that the challenge of equity um, is something that, you know, anybody that's worked in the environmental climate field is thoroughly invested in, is how do we make this shift? Um, it's been very clear in my decades, and you could have said decades and decades, of, of work at the state, local, and, and at the federal level. It's what I've done with my life. It's, it's all about equity. <laughs> you know, it's all about how do you make sure that, that those that are most disadvantaged don't continue to get disadvantaged over and over and over. And it's hugely challenging to see how that happens in a system where the privilege generally create the, the opportunity for themselves. Um, and so it's, you know, it's first of all, it's recognizing the inequities. And secondly, it's designing strategies that you know will benefit those most in need. That's what government does. <laughs> That's what it's supposed to do. That's how it's supposed to work. And we, and you know, EPA is a really good example of how we every time looked at how do you make sure that those most in need get the resources that are available, and how do you design those those strategies to make that happen? And we did it by looking at where all the pollution sits, where the challenges are for water quality, or or other land-based challenges, and how do you now look at those and understand who's benefiting, who isn't, and how you do these cleanups in a way that accelerates the opportunity for those most in need to get a piece of the pie here. And, and, it's, and it can be very challenging because uh, they, it, it's not reflected in what's required in the regulatory structure, right? And nobody says you have to fix this first. You have to, but you look at, at the constraints that you have and the limitations you have, and you do the best you can. Now, in the White House, there was a, a different approach under the Biden administration when we were looking at climate. We actually built in a requirement in the Inflation Reduction Act that 40% of the benefits had to accrue to those most in need because we made it up. We created a new statute that got passed. That's how you straightforward put your thumb on where the greatest need and opportunity is. Look, the challenge around climate change is enormously um, contentious and difficult. You, you know, you think you get over the issue of whether climate change is happening or not. And first of all, let me just say, Thank you and congratulations to the National Academies of Science and the Academies for doing all the work that they do on science. And I apologize from the bottom of my heart that you have to keep hearing the nonsense that climate change isn't real. I apologize for my entire humanity <laughs> uh, that you have to continually try to address these issues with more research when we have enough research to know everything we need, that climate change is real, that we have the opportunity to address it, and we're not moving at the pace or scale that we need to. So I have to re recognize that. But, but honestly, the, the challenge of climate change has become so big P and little p political that it, is, uh, it is, is contrary to everything that we should be doing, not just for environmental justice communities to ensure they get 40% of the benefits, but to actually just make sure that we are going to be able to hand our children a future that is livable to them. 
This is an existential challenge of which, at least in my recollection, we've never had to face. And it's, uh, so it's, it's very challenging from an equity perspective to address this. But frankly, if you don't address the equity challenge, the rest will not come because that's where poverty is, that's where the instability is, that's where insecurity arises. That is, is what we, we have to fight uh, every step of the way to figure out how you design a climate strategy that actually brings that kind of stability and vitality to the conversation around climate. Thank you so much. Pedro, how, well, let me start here. So you've been doing the human development reports, I think for about five years now. And the most recent one was entitled Breaking the Gridlock, Re-Imaging Cooperation in a Polarized World. Uh, can you tell us a little more about how you chose this potential theme? Uh, and then you can also maybe say a little more about the political polarization. And I think it builds um, on uh, what Gina has just said because uh, we are convinced uh, that the challenge uh, right now is not so much on the lack of scientific information on whether climate change is happening or not. And uh, I would argue it's not so much on climate denial, uh, which is still a problem, obviously, but it's becoming more and more a marginal problem, according to the evidence that we see from around the world. I'll just report on some findings from a recent survey conducted by the United Nations Development Program uh, in which people around the world were asked whether climate change was affecting their decisions, uh, their daily decisions, decisions where to live. 70% of the global population reported that yes, climate change was already yeah. affecting their uh, uh, lives, their decisions. So. I guess the question again, and that's what the, the, there was the motivation for our report to your question, why are we in the gridlock? Why aren't we acting with the uh, energy and the speed that is required to address not only climate change, but other uh, global challenges? But let's, let's stay focused on climate change. And so uh, one of the reasons, not the only reason, uh, um, uh, is the fact that many societies around the world are becoming polarized politically. So what is political polarization? Political polarization is not people holding different views about uh, policy priorities uh, or ideology or whether uh, we should increase taxes or reduce taxes. It's about segments of the population becoming so divided that they attach views on policy issues to their identity. So then it becomes less about having a conversation about these differences that are always there and are healthy. That's what we want in a, in a society, is to have plurality of views, a divergence of views that then get arbitrated through political processes at all levels, through social process, through discussions, through public deliberation. That's good. But political polarization is very insidious and dangerous because people then become uh, associated with belonging to groups um, in which beliefs are associated, as I alluded to, with their identity. And there are many beliefs uh, that are characterized in this way, one of which, unfortunately, uh, has to do with climate change. By the way, uh, to Gina's point about is, is this, is this a, a global problem or is this a problem that's only happening in a few countries? In two thirds of the world's countries over the last 10 years or so, two thirds, Political polarization has been increasing, has been on the rise. Um, so what, what's happening on climate change? If, if it's not climate denialism, what's the, what, where is the fracture happening? The fracture is happening along uh, two views or two beliefs. One, peop some people believe that we are not doing enough. And the other belief is that we are doing too much and we need to slow down. So that's the cleavage that we, that we see uh, 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 happening uh, at the moment. And because it's part of this process of political polarization, uh, it's uh, then becoming um, um, a barrier, poisoning uh, cooperation, uh, both within countries, but we also see it in the United Nations happening uh, across countries. 
Uh, we can go uh, to, to some of the things that we can do to address this, but I just want to, to make a comment to um, uh, say how important it is, the, the policies that Gina alluded to. So I'll, I'll, I'll use data from Europe to, to, be, to be safe here in, in Washington, I guess. Uh, there's evidence that um, an increase in the unemployment rate, so it's not the unemployment level, but an increase in the unemployment rate, so it's about change um, in Europe, is associated with an increase in one percentage uh, points uh, in the share of vote that goes to parties that are in the extremes of the political spectrum, both on the left and on the right. So you can see how important it is to address uh, these communities that uh, are left behind. Uh, and it's not so much, again, about levels, but about change, right? Whether they perceive that they are being changed. But in addition to the uh, um, economic dimensions, there's a dimension that is sometimes neglected that has to do with dignity or perceptions of dignity. And the fact that many of uh, these communities, even if they receive benefits, sometimes feel that they are not recognized. So again, to use data in, uh, in Europe, we have evidence that uh, there's a gap between this recognition, this perception of recognition between urban and rural populations. So if people are asked, do you believe that your government, that decisions are made in a way that takes into consideration what you think is important? People in urban areas feel much more recognized in the way in which they answer these questions than in rural areas. So I think there's work to be done, not only on the economic side, but also in trying to address this uh, recognition gap. Can I just make, <clears throat> do you mind if I bounce off of this for a sec? <clears throat> you know, one of the things that I've always found fascinating is that people always say they want change, but then when you deliver some, they don't. Uh, they want what they want, only better. You, you know what I mean? And, and it's, so it, it's very difficult to deal with the polarization that you're talking about. And, and we definitely, I think, see this here in the United States. And one of the challenges, I think, to bringing stability to this is that you, you uh, uh, let me just mention the Inflation Reduction Act for a minute which has proven to be a very beneficial um, uh, statute that's provided a lot of resources to make the transition to clean energy and clean transportation. I mean, a lot of, of resources, and it's just in its second year, and it's a 10-year horizon. But the reason why I wanted to mention it is that the problem I think we're facing with the Inflation Reduction Act is not that people recognize that it's growing new battery manufacturing technologies and other things, but the, one of the basic tenets of that to address the equity question was to build you know, more, more focused uh, efforts in environmental justice communities. And those are the ones that take the longs. It's, it's about collaboration and cooperation to make it happen. So what's happening is in rural areas where that money should be going and in urban areas where it should go, they're not seeing it yet or feeling it. So these big battery manufacturing technologies and more power and all these, these big investments that are being made, which total about I don't know, 360 something billion dollars, creating 500, uh, sorry, 370,000 new energy jobs, right? All of those are not going to the places that want to feel it most and need to feel it most. And so it's hugely challenging to figure out how to implement these really good ideas but to do it in a way that's going to make people see and feel that their lives are better. They, and until that happens, we can't really expect communities that have been left behind to feel like they're any better off than they used to be. And it's, so it's hugely difficult. That's why the labor issues are so important. That's why the, these opportunities to really begin strong engagement and invest in, investments in, in rural communities and in urban areas that have 
been really bearing the brunt of the challenges in this country for so long. If we can't reach them quickly, my fear is that people won't see this as the opportunity that we've all been touting. Absolutely. In terms of uh, maybe a bit on the flip side of that, in terms of the work that you're doing uh, in America All In, what are you seeing that's encouraging uh, in terms of advancements around climate, maybe kind of less in the big national space, but a little more down at the local and, and subnational level? Well, I think that's why I'm sort of driving myself crazy doing a lot of different things. And, and one of the things I am doing is America is All In, which is this really large um, collaboration of, of more than 5,000 people who's, who understand that in the United States, we have a federal government, great, but we also have a subnational government that often rules the roost. And I like that. You know, I like to know that if the federal government isn't responding, that we have a whole culture below that protects the interests of their own communities and their states. So what we've been doing with America's All In is we've been traveling across the US to make sure that we provide education and technical assistance to communities as well as states in how to access the Inflation Reduction Act, how to start holding those community conversations that we need to have in order to design uh, the strategies and the, the investments of the Inflation Reduction Act that is really going to be meaningful for everyone. And to me, that's just hugely important as well as incredibly fun because you get to meet some of the people out there across the country who are doing just God's work, if you will. Um, I mean, they, they know their communities, they're working hard at it, and they're figuring out how to access significant resources that really provide the kind of benefits that, that people need to see. This is what's gonna change the dynamic, I think, in our country, but we gotta get out there, and honestly, we have to have everybody out there getting engaged and excited about the opportunities instead of dreading the opposite. You know, it's, it has to be about building hope and opportunity. This is what, what is available to us to do. We have to pull the trigger and move this stuff forward. Well, building on that sense of building hope, Pedro, what do you see as the main opportunities for international cooperation? in addressing climate change and inequality? And how do you see us strengthening our international cooperation and building trust through those opportunities? I'll uh, address that, but first, can I comment yeah, yeah. on uh, uh, a point that uh, Gina made that I think He's is very important? He's a nice important. person. We can <laughs> totally take this. Yeah. Thank you. Um, which is this point about change. Uh, as Gina said, people always or often say, we want, we want change. Um, but one of the findings uh, of our latest human development report is that there are w widespread uh, perceptions of insecurity. Yeah. So people perceive change, uh, which for a long time was perceived as being something good in the sense that uh, future generations were seen as going to be better off than uh, uh, the parents' generation. That. The, that the direction of change is going in that direction is now um, perceived to be under threat or at least under question. Uh, according to our estimates, uh, six out of every seven people around the world are insecure about some aspects of their lives. You can understand how in many parts of the world this is understandable. Uh, if we look, for instance, as, uh, at, at forced displacement, things like refugees and internal, internal displaced people, or people that are dying in violent conflicts, these are now reaching numbers comparable to those that we saw at the end of World War II. So in many parts of the world, you can understand how people feel insecure, but six out of every seven people, and we see that in many parts of the world, the increase in these perceptions of insecurity is uh, associated with um, or, or happens in countries that have very high levels of human development. So we find that these perceptions of insecurity, and now moving to addressing your question, are, are associated with three things that, that are important for international cooperation or for cooperation more broadly. First, people that feel more insecure tend to trust others less. 
Secondly, people that feel more insecure tend to feel less in control of their lives. So they feel that they have less agency. And third, finally, people that feel more insecure tend to uh, retreat to the in-group, to find safety in, in those beliefs that are associated with the in-group. In other words, higher increase, uh, perceptions of insecurity are associated with political polarization, both on the left and on the right. And again, just to give some numbers from, from Europe, uh, the share of, of the vote that has gone to parties that are in the extremes has increased from 15% at the turn of the century in Europe to 30% now in the last round of elections. So an increase in 15 percentage points. So these perceptions of insecurity are uh, reflected in um, uh, or, or have political expression. So they, it's not only about beliefs, but they matter when it comes to behavior. So what to do about it? Obviously, addressing these perceptions of insecurity uh, uh, is, is crucial. Uh, but another thing that, that gives me hope is the fact that people often agree on more than they think they do. So I'll give an example. When it comes to climate change, 70% of the world's population is willing to make a financial sacrifice to mitigate climate change. 70% of the world's population is willing to make a personal financial sacrifice to mitigate climate change. So it's not about the belief only. They are willing to sacrifice. And then when they are asked, do you believe that other people share the same view? The percentage drops to a little over 40%. Why is this important? Because addressing climate change and other challenges similar to climate change requires not only individual commitment, personal commitment, it requires collective action. And if there, are these, if there is this, this huge gap uh, in misperception, it's a gap that reflects misperceptions really, then people are less motivated to address this challenge in a collective, in a collective way. So closing these misperception gaps, Sometimes uh, the expression is used of pluralistic ignorance. So we are living in a, sense of, in a sense of pluralistic ignorance in that people actually care quite a lot about climate change. Not everybody, but 70%. Um, and yet they believe that others around them do not. And again, no matter how committed each of us individually is to climate change, we can change how we move around, what we eat. Um, but to address the challenge, we need collective action, and reducing these misperceptions could be an important way to get there. Okay, related question for both of you. Um, what do you see as the kind of strategies that can be effective in helping us bridge some of the, the divides around political ideology to address climate change? Well, let, let me tackle that first. You, you know, the, the thing that I've been always trying to do where climate change is concerned is to frankly stop talking about climate change <laughs> in, in terms, as a big issue. I mean, I, I totally understand people are now getting it and they, they want action on it, but for a very long time, it's been denial and it continues to pervade in, in re really in, insidious ways. So what I've tried to do is try to humanize it. You know, stop talking about the planet. You know, these are issues and concepts that disempower people. Who's going to be able to fix this, right, kind of thing. And so I, I really think uh, I've spent a lot of time trying to make the connection between climate and human health, climate and air pollution, climate and opportunities to have benefits that are human benefits that people can relate to. And so I never talk without trying to make it a much more personal opportunity for people because I do feel like uh, we talk very often in scientific language that people don't relate to and don't understand, but we 
And it's not a matter of whether they're smart or not smart. It's just how you have to reach people. So I don't talk about how many, you know, how, how many greenhouse gas reductions are coming from something. I talk to them that if you build more solar and we can reduce the use of fossil fuels, your kids are going to be healthier. <laughs> your electricity bills are going to go down. You know, and that's why I took actually joined as the White House National Climate Advisor because President Biden's framing was all exactly that. He said, we're going to prove that it's cheaper. We're going to prove, prove that people will be healthier. And we're going to make sure that they understand that this is a human benefit that they can all grab and run with. Because to me, that's how you get people excited about it. And the more we can do that and, and start getting people engaged, that's the kind of movement forward that will, uh, to me, start a much larger movement. You know, I know that change happens incrementally, but I also know that the first tranche of incremental change you make powers the rest to get done more quickly. And that's what we have to, I think, focus on. I, I fully agree with, uh, with Jean. And, it, and in fact, the reason why something like a human development report started bringing uh, climate change more and more into, into the analysis and other process of dangerous planetary change, it's not only climate, it's what's happening on, when it comes to biodiversity loss uh, and other aspects, is so crucial because the planet will be fine. You know, the planet has been around for 4.5 billion years. It, it has been much hotter. It has been much cooler. Uh, it's going to be fine. It's not about the planet. It's about people. It's about us. It's about what we, what's happening to us and what's happening to our children. So I fully, I fully agree with that. And a lot of the work that we're doing in our office is about making sure that it connects. It's not about temperature, the 1.5 degrees. It's about what this means uh, for opportunities for people, uh, how people are likely to suffer. Uh, as a result of, of, of these changes. And also very important, and it's sort of the flip side of it, that we are the agents that are driving these changes. You know, it's not like an asteroid that's coming and impacting on us, or a volcanic eruption, which was what drove previous uh, mass extinctions in the evolution of our planet. This is within our power to change. So this notion of agency, I think, is very important. Uh, and that's why I think that something we've been trying to do as well in our report is to uh, balance the discourse on climate change as a threat with a discourse that is framed uh, as an opportunity, um, uh, economic opportunity. You know, last year, according to Bloomberg, $1.8 trillion flowed into renewable energy. $1.3 trillion is about the size of the um, economy of the Republic of Korea. So this is big. With all the investments, with all the jobs uh, that, that went uh, along with it. So uh, rebalancing, it's not denying that there are uh, threats um, and, and that we face um, uh, challenges if we don't act. So we need, we need obviously that. But thinking that that alone is a, a discourse and an agenda that mobilize people to change their behavior, I think is insufficient. We need to rebalance that with a discourse uh, uh, of possibility. I, I would not even use the word optimistic, but of possibility that it is possible. And that since we are driving this change, we humans, the choices we make, we also have agency in shaping this. You know, I have always thought that the planet must think that human beings are the most obnoxious species <laughs> on the face of the earth. But, I, you know, I, I couldn't really a agree with you more, Pedro, which I think we're just the agreement society here. <laughs> but but um, I, I do also think that th there just needs to be more leadership. You know, one of the reasons... That, that we're at Bloomberg is, that I'm doing work at Bloomberg is, they're trying to make sure that we can build that subnational layer of, of authority um, that can, can really help at a time when the federal government may not really be aligned with what I think the needs and wants of, of the people are. And it's, and it's uh, 
I just think it's really important for us to recognize that there are a number of strategies on how to reach people and how to get them to feel that there's opportunity and hope. You know, when I leave here, I don't, I, I don't go around saying, woe is me, I'm, I'm doing fighting words. I mean, we're gonna win this fight, right? And I think that there, we have, as far as I can see, we have every technology, program, process, we absolutely need to tackle the climate crisis at scale. And, and, and what we're seeing now is that in, in the US, if, if you're expanding your capacity for, for more energy, it's going to renewables by about three to one. You know, it's not going to expanding fossil fuels. And I think we also have to recognize that, you know, the fossil fuel industry is very pervasive. It's, it's becoming very challenging but we have to also look at the disbenefits of fossil fuels and make sure that, that we're talking about clean energy versus fossil fuels in a way that people can understand. So they understand why we're looking to make that shift to clean energy and reminding them that the, you know, the air and water and land pollution related to fossil is is part of the reason why is the reason why we are here, and and we need to make that change, and we need to make it as dramatic as we can. Right. Well, I like um, the way both of you all have tapped into something that's been part of the conversations we've been having throughout this uh, event, which is this idea of working local, and that the local community is an integral part of the solution and engaging and empowering members of the local community, going back to an expression uh, from many decades ago, think globally, act locally. Um, empowering them to be part of the solution is a critical part of building the leadership and a critical part of gauging, of transforming the conversation from one about abstract ideas about the planet and concrete ideas about everyday lived experience. I think that was an excellent point. Related to the, the bigger picture, though, at the international scale, recently a loss and damage fund was created. And I'm curious to hear from, from both of you, starting with you, Pedro, what do you see as the opportunities that this fund creates for us in terms of helping to deal with both short-term challenges that nations are facing, but also building long-term resilience for communities that are most vulnerable to climate change? I think, uh, Carlton, that it was um, a watershed moment in the fact that the international community, countries, the parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, agreed on something that not only will have practical benefits uh, to as many as 3 billion people around the world, um, I think the pledges are around $600 million. So there's, there's that practical element that I think is very important. But as important in my view is the fact that there was a sense that justice was served. And there was a sense that finally we got some recognition of the uh, uh, justices and injustices associated with climate change. Because for a long time, within the context of the convention, we've had funding dedicated to adaptation. So this is to support countries to adapt to the negative effects of climate change. We've had funds uh, that support mitigation. So supporting lower income countries with the investments that they need to take, to make this transition towards uh, renewable energy. So adaptation and, and mitigation are enshrined in the, in the convention, including through financial mechanisms. But there was always this conversation around loss and damage, around this idea that some things have already been lost, unfortunately, uh, and this is unfair and unjust. And it has been very contentious, as you can imagine. Um, uh, and the fact that there was a recognition, first of all, of, of this idea of loss and damage, and that on top of it, financial resources were, were allocated to actually uh, take account for this injustice, I think was a watershed moment and a turning point. Can I just join in because, uh, you know, 
I, I have to say that, that it's so multidimensional, the, these issues, but I think my first point is that the loss and damage fund was great, it's just not enough money. And the problem we have in the United States is the embarrassment of, not, of Congress not allowing us to actually make good on our pledge, which I have to, that's the first thing I have to do when I talk to people you know, internationally is apologize for that. It's just disgraceful. Um, and I don't think we can fail to acknowledge the fact that, you know, the developing, the developed world has benefited at the expense of the developing world. And we have to be honest about it. And we have to think about how we expand the uh, loss and damage fund at a level that's commensurate with the challenge. So I agree that it's, it was a big step forward, but I'm embarrassed about the inability of the United States to meet our commitment. The other thing is that uh, I've been also doing work um, with a couple of uh, investment companies to advise them some of which is, uh, is work they're doing in the Global South and in Latin America. And, and it's, it's really interesting, but what, what, what we are now doing that's different than before is there's a lot of public-private partnerships now, investment opportunities that are very good, that provide an opportunity for real investment that won't break the bank but will be very carefully directed towards the needs of, of those countries, which is my third bugaboo, is that the, the folks that I work with, I work with a group called uh, Pegasus Capital Advisors, another with TPG. And these are, these are significant companies. But what we talk about is what's consistent with the needs of those countries, not what's consistent with our ability to invest so that I'll make some money but it won't fundamentally add to the infrastructure of those countries. Look, I am seeing people invest in the solar arrays in the middle of nowhere when they don't have water in that country that, that's drinkable and they don't have food systems that provide for them. For crying out loud, we need to do better than that, which is why I'm at Tufts working at the Fletcher School of International Diplomacy because they're working with the countries themselves to develop net zero plans that are how I grow that fundamental infrastructure that everyone here at, takes for granted. So all this stuff is great, but you have to really think about how you invest, how we do those partnerships in a way that really Allow these countries to succeed, not allow us to put a check mark behind greenhouse gas reductions or carbon credits that we were able to accrue that, that really don't get at the fundamental needs or foundation that allow countries to grow. So it's very comp uh, complicated, but there's opportunities that are just enormous because we have the wherewithal to do this. And it is not at the expense of investing. It's making money, but doing it the right way and not expecting that you're going to get rich by it. You're simply going to make progress. And there's a lot of people and companies ready and willing to do that. Pedro? Join just yeah, please. I, I fully agree with, with Gina. I mean, I, I'm, we have to I, think of something to disagree <laughs> about. <laughs> I'll see if I come up with something. <laughs> uh, in the sense that, so the focus of these funds that I mentioned, the Green Climate Fund, the Adaptation Fund, Loss and Damage Fund, it's about public money, commitments by government. Uh, public money is essential and not enough. But it's not sufficient. Private capital needs to flow into these investments. And, and the, the uh, complement to, to Gina's point that I would add is that now we have an opportunity in the context of the Paris Agreement. Countries, uh, if you're familiar, have uh, committed to um, set their own targets. So they are voluntary, sovereign targets about what they want to do to mitigate and adapt to climate change. And they do that formally by submitting what's called national determined contributions. So the acronym is NDCs. But what's, what we are observing and what's interesting is that countries are now looking at these NDCs, not as climate mitigation and adaptation plans, but actually as development plans. Yes. 
because they are embedding in that um, uh, how they see the way in which prospects for development, for transforming their economies, for getting to those, uh, to meeting those aspirations on, on, on food security, on poverty reduction, on jobs. Uh, so they are becoming embedded in these NDCs. And uh, one of the things that UNDP is doing is supporting uh, countries in, um, in doing that. And, and this, the second point I, I will make, I don't want to get into the details of the Paris Agreement, but one of the um, key ideas of the Paris Agreement was that these national uh, commitments would um, be more and more ambitious over time. And countries are now working on a new round of commitments that are going to be submitted uh, um, uh, in 2025, uh, so 10 years after Paris, uh, at the Conference of Parties of the Convention uh, to be held in Brazil. And I think we have an opportunity here to really marshal uh, the, the private capital, the private actors that you alluded to, public actors and advocate to raise the ambition, but not only raise the ambition in, in the plans, but also making sure that the capital then is there, both public and private, to enable countries to fulfill on these pledges. It is, it is absolutely, it's a critical moment <laughs> for, the, for, the, for the NDCs. Both the US is now looking at, at what we're doing here, but uh, Bloomberg also put up a significant amount of resources to help the development of NDCs in the countries that you're talking about. Because if they can envision their future, and that future can get us to one that is, you know, that is healthier and safer and more stable, there is just a, an opportunity for us to really get around all the climate drama and get it really what we all need which is we need economically viable countries that support one another. And there, the, Bloomberg thought we'd get about seven countries that would want to be resourced. I think it's dozens are already there saying, OK, let's work on this. And, and if you can get the path that provides a, a hope and opportunity that people can begin to see. I think you can also start marrying that with public and private monies that actually will provide a real path forward. So there is, you know, as much as I talk about the challenges, I, I feel like the hope and opportunity is there. Uh, we just have to figure out how to politically get along well enough to make it happen. Let me take Still advantage of that, yeah. uh, of that opening you've raised to talk about, to ask a question that I want to come back to you all. We're going to go to the audience for Q&A now, but I want to see the question for the future. What can leaders do, not at the national level, but kind of at the local and the subnational level to start building trust with communities and to make resources available, like we're just discussing, both for the private sector and the public sector, to make sure that marginalized communities and communities that have been left behind of future of past advances are now at the center of planning for the future. But I want to open up for Q&A. Uh, we've got uh, mics who are available for folks in the auditorium to go to the mics. And then we also have folks online. And we're going to start with those who are online uh, and see what, if any, questions we have uh, that, from folks online. Thank you. Um, and as we get into virtual questions, we once again encourage folks in the auditorium to start lining up and folks on Slido to uh, upvote questions they like uh, to express their interest. So our first online question is, how can we position these climate and health inequities from a business value or health economics perspective? Goes back to the whole business discussion we're already having. What are your thoughts? Well, I, the, I guess this is an easy one for me because at EPA, that's all we did. <laughs> you, I think that the thing that uh, we learned at, at EPA was that you have to think about how do you put a price tag on health benefits and how do you start counting them? And I think that the, there's, there's real opportunity to start looking at all of these shifts that we're, we're trying to to position ourselves to be successful in, 
is, is to, to really anticipate those benefits, to make them clear, and to economically look at the challenges that we're facing and the opportunities ahead. This is not rocket science. This is done all, all the time in, in, in federal government and at the local level, so you can determine how best to take money and spend it wisely. But there is nothing more, uh, I think, beneficial than improving the health of individuals and communities. That's what it's all about. Other question? Uh, Sandra Bear with Smart Cities World, based in London. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, insights. Uh, you said earlier that the issues of climate change are contentious and challenging, and I think most importantly, the big investments take time. But regarding inequality and equity, I'm curious about solutions. Uh, it seems that those communities that are left behind don't feel engaged, as I think you mentioned. And what is it? Could you give us two examples of solutions, uh, actions we could take now to engage those folks, maybe to better communicate? Whether things are happening or not, let's keep communicating to them, because if they feel left out, uh, they are. So I'd love some actual solutions, actions to take, uh, you know, down-to-earth ideas. Thank I want to take the moderator's privilege, if I oh. could, to jump in on this one. Um, this is an issue that I've raised with some of my colleagues about the whole dominant conversation about climate, which is too often it ignores what are the health and life-threatening challenges that communities are already dealing with. Because some people say this is an existential crisis, but if I have a father who's on life support, I have a mother that heart disease all exacerbated by air pollution, you want to talk to me about an existential crisis. I'm living through the crisis right now. If there isn't help for me to deal with the challenges that are my survival challenges, my bandwidth to get concerned about what's going to happen in 2050 is going to be really low. So I think I always say, you have to start by helping the community with the issues that they're currently facing and build trust and show a genuine concern what they're dealing with right now, even if it's limited to environmental related challenges. And then from there, build to the broader set of environmental challenges. Most of them are very connected and very related. And so I would start off with that recommendation, but I want to go to our panelists. I think Carlton answered, so we're off the hook or I'm off the hook. But I, I just want to, to emphasize the importance of connecting these global challenge or existential risks to, to what's happening on the ground. So a lot of it has to do uh, with uh, providing actual economic benefits, uh, as we mentioned. But I think that we need to do much more on the, if you want, narrative side of things and the way in which we communicate about why is climate change a challenge that has inf implications for people today and where they live. So remember, I started by saying that um, Inequality was seen as an economic inequality, as a problem of the here and now, and climate change as a problem of the future and in faraway places, you know, glaciers melting. And actually, we have to recognize that the two are connected and finding ways of communicating that. And I think that we are falling short, perhaps, on, on the communicating, uh, communication side of things. I'm going to give you an example of a couple of places that uh, I've visited uh, uh, lately, and and one of them was is a it, there's a lot of emphasis now on community colleges, and a lot of resources are being directed there, which I think is hugely helpful. Um, one of the colleges, the community college that I visited, you know, their entire focus was on uh, how do I fix electric vehicles. <laughs> it was teaching a skill set. You know, the other was how do, what is the, all the heat pump opportunities here and how do I start to engage them and how do I repair them, how do I install them? So now we have a whole other, you know, opportunity for individuals that, that really, and they are of all ages, uh, the, this was young people to, to folks in their 40s and 50s looking at career changes. So there's a whole other group of jobs now 
open to people, that, that are resourced, that, that's important. And another place I went was a, a community that's been trying to deal with a port that they live on the fringe of, where all the dredge trucks park forever and spew out their fossil fuel emissions. And how do we begin to have a dialogue that actually can start changing that dynamic? And it's, it's fascinating. Uh, you know, these conversations are happening now because a signal has been sent that it's no longer acceptable to behave this way. And there's opportunities, I think, at all levels of government to start having these interactions. But when you're dealing with communities that are disadvantaged and that have equity challenges the way that we see them in the United States and beyond, if the first, your first uh, shot at this, it, it must be a dialogue. It must be communication. It just has to be sitting down with normal human beings who struggle and finding out how they want you to be able to begin to address them. We've made so many mistakes, especially at the federal level, about anticipating other people's needs before we have even had a conversation on what they are. Can I just add the something, it, it relates to this point that I made earlier about misperceptions. Survey data from the United States show that if you ask people in disadvantaged communities if they care about their environment, they say overwhelmingly that they do. If you ask people in these same communities if they think people around them care, the percentage drops dramatically. So again, I think that we need to do a lot of work on this challenge of misperception, of pluralistic ignorance that's happening not only globally, as I mentioned, but also in local communities. And how do we, do we harness that? Because if people care, we are almost halfway there already. Next question. Uh, yes, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Jairo Garcia. I teach classes at Johns Hopkins University at the Georgia Institute of Technology in climate policies and urban development. Just thank you for the panelists for the great conversation. So you allow me, I'm gonna ask a question for Pedro and another for Gina. Uh, Pedro, this is the thing about climate migrants. Uh, there are plenty of studies that shows that uh, the heat waves in the Middle East in the 2000s were the culprit of the political instability and the massive migration to Europe. And here in America too, uh, we have a heat wave in the Central America that is pushing migrants to the United States. And those migrants are sparking uh, what you call the uh, you know, a, a nationalism and other kind of uh, polarization that you mentioned. So my question for you is um, what the uh, UNDP is doing specifically to address this issue of climate migrants, uh, because I know that you're working in the countries, but what you're doing for people that need, are forced to displace because of climate. Uh, and for Gina, uh, we're gonna have this conversation, this afternoon, a conversation about the Chevron case. And then we know that the Supreme Court dismissed the Chevron case, and this is the base of many of the policies that we have in the United States, not only for the environment, for climate. So I want to pick your brain about, if you have a magic wound, would you raise Reinstall it, or you do something else in order to be sure that we have the, the foundation policies in order to address climate change. Thank you. Thank you. So, so I think we need to, to have a conversation, and I, I need to learn more about um, what you suggested because I, I think we need to be a bit cautious with the claims uh, that connect um, uh, climate change to, to the movement of people, um, in part because people adapt and have a capacity to adapt. So if you live in a place that gets very warm, like Washington DC over the last two days, and you can afford air conditioning as, you, as we can, if you have the means, maybe you don't need to move. If you don't have the means to adapt, that's a different story. But I, I think that uh, uh, making, establishing causal links between uh, climate hazards, particularly temperature changes and the movement of people, is challenging and hard because we need to take into consideration these behavioral responses and how they are associated to uh, the economic conditions and the which people live. 
it's easier, and that's what we have done in this Human Climate Horizons platform, to connect to things like mortality rates. So if you live in a place in which you have uh, uh, changes in temperature, you can establish more directly relationships with the uh, mortality rates or food productivity, for instance, because you know that if crops are not within a certain uh, interval, uh, they will fail. Some crops, at least, like corn and wheat, uh, if they are not on a certain temperature interval, they, they, they will fail. So um, uh, we, haven't, we, we want to do that, to establish links between climate hazards uh, and uh, the movement of people, but it's harder than for other aspects because we need to incorporate this behavioral response element. I'm going to be try to be quick about Chevron <laughs> doctrine. Um, I, how many people know about this? Oh, see, most people know about it. Uh, so let, let's be very quick. Um, you, you know, Chevron basically is a 40-year-old um, uh, sort of uh, sort of rule of the road that we have relied on for a long time, which is when when a, st a statute has the ambiguities in it, you know, which every statute does, um, and, and when it hasn't been specifically spoken to in the statute itself, then, it, then you have to answer this question on how you deal with it. And so EPA and, uh, and other agencies then have to reasonably look at what the statute might have meant and make a decision on how to implement it. And so that's what Chevron Doctrine has been like. It's 14,000 court cases have, it's come up and it's never been overturned. Well, obviously the Supreme Court decided to do something different um, with this and decided to sort of toss it out, which really means what's gonna happen is that court, the courts and, and, and judges will have to interpret scientific data. Um, it, good luck to them to make decisions about, about uh, uh, whether or not the agencies appropriately and reasonably made a judgment in the face of ambiguity. I, I think it is going to tie up every decision that the federal government is going to be making um, to the extent that it's available in those issues. Um, because that, that is just one more way of stopping the wheels of justice from turning, if you will. Um, and so I, it's, it, it's driven me almost more crazy than a presidential immunity decision. Uh, add the both of them, and I've gone bat house uh, for, the, for the past uh, couple of weeks. But I'm better now. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm basically just feistier, but we're going to win anyways. Uh, we're going to make the decisions that we have to make. I think at some point in time, the, the Supreme Court's going to have to revisit this, these decisions. Um, hopefully not because there's a record now of how disastrous they've been. Another... We have another uh, virtual question, and I think this might be our last question, depending on time. Um, this is sort of a two-parter. Um, so for Pedro, um, what are some solutions that the uh, Global North can um, consider or employ uh, to support the uh, Global South in responding to um, inequality uh, as a result of climate change? Um, and then for Gina, um, how can the United States uh, address those same thing issues um, through policies that already exist, such as Justice 40 and the IRA, um, as well as potential future policies. So just reiterating some of the points that, we, that we've discussed, I, I think that uh, it's important to make good on commitments when it comes to financial flows uh, to low and, and middle income countries, not only because they are needed and we have huge financing gaps, but also, as I alluded to, because in, international, in the international context, uh, some low and middle income countries feel a deep sense of unfairness. Uh, and so the symbolic um, uh, signal uh, that this gives is, is extremely important. Also, because if countries pull out from this international effort, 
that is seen by others, by the public opinion in other countries, as unfair. So I think keeping this sense of um, collective commitment to climate change by uh, higher income countries uh, is, uh, is, is crucial, both because it makes a difference financially, but also symbolically, because it's the one way in which we can keep our international community together and cohesive in addressing climate change. Because we gave a lot of emphasis here in our discussion to the local level and the national level, but let's be real about climate change. It's a challenge that needs international cooperation. There are many things that you can address at the borders. Movement of people, movement of capital, movement of goods and services. You can calibrate how much you want your economy or your country to be. But climate change is not something you can solve at the border. You need international cooperation. And I think it's very important that we keep that in mind. I actually think the second part of that question was already pretty fully discussed. So I think we probably ought to just make sure we can fit another question. All right, so we'll take one last question from the audience and then we'll wrap up. So my name is Shonali Pachori. I work with the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Austria. Uh, so thank what does you. That mean? It was a very illuminating discussion. Thank you very much to the panel. I'm just curious, we've talked a lot about um, sort of bringing those who are deprived above a certain threshold. But reducing inequalities is also talking about con contracting those on the top. Uh, so I'm just curious uh, about whether you think that is part of addressing inequalities. Because we do know that the top 10% or the richest 10% of global population, and they live all over the world, contribute 50% of emissions. So should contracting the richest 10% be part of addressing inequalities and the climate challenge? And if so, how? Can, uh, I'm glad I'm a moderator for that I question. I should have taken the last question. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, uh, Yaza is doing great work. Uh, Gina was asking what, what is Yaza, and uh, we collaborate with Yaza, and very proud in our office, and uh, have done a lot of the modeling work that underpins many of the climate science uh, that informs the deliberations of the IPCC and, and, and many of us in, in the community working on climate change, so thank you. So I, I think the point is very important. So the point, and, and this is something that we've um, uh, highlighted in our reports over the years, there's a difference between establishing a floor uh, beneath uh, nobody, nobody else falls and what we can call gradients. So gradients are about disparities uh, along different social economic classes. Now, I, I would say that we need to care about gradients, but not necessarily always by moving those that are doing well uh, lower. So just to give a very obvious example, we have gradients on health. So people from higher levels of um, socioeconomic conditions have much better health outcomes than those with lower levels of um, uh, social economics. So I think the solution is not to bring those that are doing well when it comes to health outcomes down. It's about finding ways of uh, redressing uh, uh, the gradient. Uh, so that would be the way in which I would, uh, I would address that question. I think we should care about gradients, we should care about inequalities, but in ways that sort of rebalances them by moving those at the bottom up. So we, we've got to wrap up, but each of you will have one takeaway kind of opportunity. I've put a bug in each of your ears about leadership. What would you say needs to happen for leadership in order for us to move forward in tackling climate change and inequality? Uh, so, so my uh, suggestion is again to go back to the narratives that we're putting out there in the world. I think we have to rebalance narratives around crisis, existential crisis, with a narrative of possibility and opportunity. Uh, so that would be my, 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 my main recommendation. Uh, and I think, uh, it, like, we, we seem to be a bit clonish. We're both <laughs> doing the same thing. But I, I, I really want people uh, to feel like there is a real opportunity with climate change. 
Um, I think I, nobody wants the climate to be changing in this way, but it does allow us to rethink. Um, it allows us to look at these inequities. It allows us to look at the opportunities that we have. So I would like to make sure that we all don't get so down that we realize that we're, that we're uh, not building the kind of hope and opportunity framing that we actually need for a challenge as big as this. This is not going to be solved over the next 10 or 20 years. This is, this is a, a, as, as we've said before, an existential challenge. And I just don't think we win by talking about this in any other way other than turning it into the biggest opportunity and sort of kick in the pants we could. Look, the world was never great even before climate change became such a significant <laughs> issue. So get over it. <laughs> Let's all pull ourselves out of the doldrums uh, and challenge where we need to and run like hell to the future we want for our kids. That's what I'm doing, and it's my kids and grandkids, and I'm not going to turn into the nastiest old woman you've, w woman you've ever seen. <laughs> I'm going to continue to keep pushing in a way that I think we need to to actually make the change that, that, that our kids deserve. Uh, there is nothing more important than that for me, and I think for most of us here, so thanks. Thank you both. This has been an excellent time. So for the audience, uh, this is an opportunity for us all to take a break and lunch is available outside until about 1.30. The next session on the main stage here is gonna be transportation and infrastructure. And then uh, climate science in the courts will be here from three to 4.15. Thank you, everyone.